Now we are in uh, chapter 7 of uh, the Townsend book. We are going to continue following the book uh, pretty closely. Um, this screencast will be, over, will be for the entire chapter 7 and uh, where we are going to treat the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. So in this chapter, we will first introduce the importance of the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Uh, we will do that by showing that the potential energy uh, corresponding to that system uh, is a good approximation to around the minimum for most um, potential well, which around the minimum. We will then uh, introduce an operator approach where we use operators to solve for the Hamiltonian of that system. After we do that, we'll study a little bit the consequence on the physical properties of system that can be described that way. And we will talk, for example, on, uh, on, uh, about the um, uncertainty principle uh, and related to, the, um, to, to also the zero point energy. Uh, one thing that, that's going to come as a very important, uh, crucial point is the correspondence principle. We will be able to connect the quantum mechanical nature of harmonic oscillator with the classical intuition we have for an harmonic oscillator. And uh, finally, after that, we will go back to the way uh, we can solve the same problem uh, from a differential equation approach. So in other words, um, a little bit the way we do it when we use wave function approach. So when we use the, the X representation explicitly from the, from the outset. Um, so this is what we are going to do. Uh, we will also look at the time evolution. And uh, so this is, a, this is a fairly dense chapter. Uh, it's a very important chapter because we are really highlighting a number of important, sp important properties of quantum mechanics. OK, let's get started. So the imp importance of harmonic oscillator. Well, one of the very first thing we do in a physics class, in a, in a normal f in, in, a, in an introductory physics class, is look at the pendulum. And when we do that, uh, using a, a, a diagram like this one here, we realize that the total energy of the system can be written as the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. In this case, this is gravitational potential energy, which can be written in, as a function of the angle theta that, is, that the pendulum is, is being uh, displaced from origin, that, that describes how far it is from the origin. And then, as always, we do a small angle approximation. And uh, I'd like to ask you, please do not forget that everything you write from there is a small angle approximation. People kind of forget the starting uh, hypothesis. But in any case, in this scale, this case, a small angle approximation, in other words, we stay close to the minimum, uh, provide us a possibility to, to replace 1 minus cos theta by theta square from using Taylor series. And then, we can, uh, of course, uh, connect the theta with the length of the arc, x, and then we end up with a situation that looks like the total energy is the kinetic energy mv squared over 2 plus a potential energy that's mg x squared over 2l. Uh, the most important thing here is that the potential energy depends on x squared, which is very much like what you know for a spring as well, for a harmonic oscillator. So we, have, we can actually, in fact, make it uh, even more uh, obvious by uh, talking about the spring constant k equal mg over l and uh, and introduce a frequency and we end up with the potential energy uh, with we end up with with the, the, the equation we want so before we we move on i like to tell you that this is a pretty good approximation for around the local minimum for any potential that shows a minimum so for example here it's a it's a general shape of a potential and uh, we can expand in Taylor series around x0. And uh, of course, uh, this, is a tip, this is really the usual formula of, uh, for the Taylor series. Uh, one thing that's very important to note is that the first derivative is 0. Indeed, uh, we are calculating a derivative at the minimum. So as we know, the derivative at the minimum is 0. Uh, and then we also know it's a minimum. Therefore, the second derivative has to be positive, right? Otherwise, it would be a maximum. Um, and then we find that any potential around the minimum can be written essentially as a parabola, which actually you could have told by just looking at the shape of the potential there. Of course, it is only true for small displacement. So please remember, this is the same thing we did for the pendulum. It only works for the small angle oscillation. Same thing here. 
But it's a good approximation. It's a good approximation. We have harmonic effect and we are, we, we are quite pleased with this. So the potential can be, can be actually written like this as well, uh, where we just decided to put Vx0 as the origin. This is, is really doesn't change anything in our description. Okay. All right. So in other words, we end up with this potential. And what we are going to do in this screencast, in actually in this chapter 7, is find a way to solve this problem quantum mechanically in one dimension. We will actually solve it in three dimensions in, in a later chapter, uh, but uh, the, the concept are going to be all introduced in this chapter. Okay, so time to move to uh, the, now that we've set the stage, time to move to how we are going to do it. And we are going to do it using operators. Um, because we like operators, uh, it turns out that it's much easier to work with operators than to work with wave function for this particular problem. Uh, we just need to set the stage properly for the operators. So here is the, the idea. The potential, the kinetic, the, 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 the operator that corresponds to the, to the total energy is, of course, the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is written as a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay? The difference here, and I'd like to, again, uh, insist on this, is that we, we have operators all over the place. So we have px squared and we have x squared. Both of them are operators. Now, the big problem we have, of course, with that equation is that x and px do not commute. Therefore, we can't use eigenstate of px and eigenstate of x to solve this problem because we know that the eigenstate of px are not eigenstate of x and vice versa. Therefore, neither of them are eigenstate of h. Okay? But the point is, we have a problem that's well posed. And uh, what we are going to do here, and it's be going to become clear, this, uh, this is the most important thing that we are going to do with the concept. We are going to introduce two new operators uh, that will replace x and px mathematically, and they will allow us to solve the problem very elegantly. So just bear with me for a second. This is the definition. We are going to, so we have this, this, uh, this important uh, uncertain, uh, this important, I was about to say uncertainty principle, which is really related to this, but we have this commutator between x and px, and we are going to do, introduce these two operators. So don't be scared, uh, just focus on a, because the a dagger is obviously the adjoint of a. And we introduce this, um, if for another reason, for convenience, okay? Now, people who remember a previous chapter remember that we introduced the, the raising and lowering operator j plus and j minus earlier when we were talking about the angular, um, uh, the spin angular momentum. And we did this and uh, we just, for example, we had j plus, which was jx plus ijy, okay? Uh, this is a bit reminiscent of this. The only difference, of course, is that we have extra terms like m omega and square root m omega over 2h bar. And the reason we have that is because of units. Uh, the units of x and the units of px are obviously different. And so if we want to sum uh, these two operators, we certainly need to, to, to make sure we work in the same units. In fact, a and a dagger, and I invite you to, to, to check that, a and a dagger are indeed dimensionless. Okay. So a dagger is just uh, obtained by the second equation, which is simply minus, we have a minus sign since x and px are Hermitian operators, as we know. Okay? All right. So we can actually calculate, so of course we can get x and px from these two equations. We just sum the, the, first, the first equation or we subtract them. So we can, if we, if we can solve problem for a and a dagger, we can certainly solve them for x and px. Now the question is, how does the, uh, the, the, the commutator between x and px uh, uh, translate into commutator between a and a dagger? Well, it turns out that if you do this properly, a and a dagger do not commute, and the commutator between them is actually uh, makes, takes a very elegant form of being one, the identity operator. Uh, I invite you to stop the screencast at this point and to calculate this explicitly. This is something that we would have, that we do in class, of course. Uh, it takes about five minutes and it's a good, uh, it's a good, uh, good exercise to, to just to remember the, how to calculate these things there. Okay, so the point is that the xpx equal ih bar can be translated into the commutator a and a dagger equal one. This is, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. 
So far, we have not done much, in fact. We just introduced new operators that replace x and px. Now, the good point, and this is where things will, will come, become very elegant, we are going to now try to calculate the Hamiltonian no, more, no longer in terms of x and px, but in terms of a and a dagger. And we do that simply by substituting the two equations that are in the blue box in the equation for the Hamiltonian. So this is exactly what's on this screen here. And you replace x and px in those two boxes. And when you do that, and you remember, of course, that a and a dagger do not commute, but have a one as a commutator, what you do, what you find out after a few minutes of calculation, and again, please pause the screencast and do it, you find that the Hamiltonian operator is going to be written as h bar omega times a dagger a plus one half. So this is the reason why we introduce the a and a dagger operators is because the Hamiltonian takes on a very nice and compact form. In addition, we will find that by solving the problem for a dagger a, Operator, so we have a new operator which is obtained by the, the, the product uh, or the, the application of a dagger and a will allow us to, under, to have a nice understanding of the physics. So what's really important to understand at this point is that we've done most of the hard work. Okay, most of the hard work was to, to recast the problem in the uh, using x and px operators into a problem using a dagger and a operators. Okay. So let's do that. That's what we want to do. So we just need to, to solve this for the new operator a dagger a. And I'm going, I'm going to give you the answer, really, we are because, of, because of the name of the operator. The new operator n is actually called the number operator. And we are going to spend the next few minutes proving why we call it the number operator. So this is the problem. Let's try to solve for the eigenstates of the operator n. OK, so we know first that n remember n is a dagger a, is Hermitian, correct? Because n dagger is the a dagger a dagger, which is a dagger a. In other words, n is Hermitian. Therefore, the eigenstate of n are real, okay? Which makes sense because the, the, the Hamiltonian is essentially h bar omega n plus one half. So n has to be Hermitian since h is Hermitian. So it's another way to look at it, okay? So we are going to write this, uh, th this problem as, as the first equation there, where eta is the eigenstate of n for states uh, ket eta, and eta is definitely a real number because n is Hermitian, okay? Now, we also know that if we write a, the, the operator a on eta as a wave function, as, as a ket psi, we find that the expectation value of n for one of its eigenstates is going to be a positive number. So the only way, the reason why we say that is because the bracket psi psi has to be positive. Or, I mean, po not strictly positive, it can also be equal to zero. So in other words, these two equations there that are followed by blue arrows, tell us that the eigenstate, the, the eigenvalue of n must be positive. So we know two things now. They are positive and they are real. Okay? So let's try to see how we can move on from there. And for that, we are going to establish a couple of commutation relations, um, which is something that's always nice to do when we try to solve problems uh, using operators. So first of all, let's try to calculate the commutator between n and a. n is a dagger a. Therefore, we can use the usual formula for the commutator between the product of operator and another operator. OK, and that means that we get this. Again, good time to, to pause the screencast and do it yourself. We know that a dagger a is going to be equal to minus 1 because a, a dagger is one. We did this earlier in the screencast. So we find that the, the commutation between, the commutator between n and a is minus a. Likewise, we can calculate the commutator between n and a dagger. And of course, in this case, we, what appears is the commutator a and a dagger, which is equal to one. Therefore, the commutator between n and a dagger 
is a dagger. This is the kind of relationships that are very easy to calculate unless you just listen to the screencast without doing it. In this case, it looks mysterious. So please do it and it sh you should see this very quickly. So we have established this. We are very happy. N and A, the commutator between N and A is minus A and the commutator between N and A dagger is A dagger. So one way to, rem to remember this is, of course, that A and A dagger is A dagger with a plus that looks like a dagger. And then an A is A. Since there is no dagger, there is a minus. That's one way that I remember it myself. Uh, but you can use whichever trick you want. Okay. Now, what's the action of A dagger on eta? So for that, we are going to start from the first line. And we want to see uh, what happens if I, if I look at the action of N on A dagger eta. And we know that because N and A dagger the commutator between n and a dagger is a dagger. We can write the first line. Yeah. Now we also know that the operator n applied to the eigenstate eta is of course the number eta times the eigenstate eta. So we see there that automatically we see that the action of n a dagger is eta plus one times a dagger eta. And so this is one of those things that we understand as when we do more quantum mechanics. When we see an equation like this, we realize directly that A dagger eta is also an eigenstate of n for, eigens for eigenvalue eta plus 1. Right? That's what it means. So if eta is an eigenstate of n for eigenvalue eta, then A dagger eta is also an eigenstate of n, in this case, for eigenvalue eta plus 1. So it looks like a dagger would seem to looks like a raising operator, right? You increase the value of eta by one. And of course you can do, yeah, so this is what we have. So we call it the raising operator for that reason. You can do the same trick for a, and I'm going to go a bit faster on this since it's exactly the same procedure as before. But the point is that the action of a on eta is that a eta is also an eigenstate of n, but in this time, in this case, for eigenvalue eta minus one. In other words, a looks like the lowering operator, because if we start from an eigenstate of n with eigenvalue eta, the application of a provide me eigenvalue eta minus one, uh, eigenvalue eta minus one for another eigenstate of n. So now we are ready to solve the problem. So far, we know that eta is positive, uh, and we have not found anything, any maximal value for, for eta. However, we know that there is a minimum value for eta. It's at least positive. Okay? It cannot be negative. So let's try to see what's the minimum value of eta. We are going to do that very nicely with the operators. So let's call it eta minimum. So we know there is a minimum value of eta, right, since eta is positive. Uh, it could be zero, but it doesn't have to be. And what I'm going to do there for the first equation is to try to lower, because we know that A is a lowering operator, I'm going to lower, lower that state. But we know I cannot lower a minimum state, right? Since it's already minimum, the only way to lower it is to get a zero state, so to, to destroy the state. So A eta minimum is equal to zero. Now, I can apply a dagger on the left-hand side of this. Of course, operating an a dagger on a zero state is still zero, but the advantage now is that I, I have a dagger a, which is the n operator. So in other words, after we all set and everything is all set and done, we find that eta minimum is the number, eta minimum, has to be equal to zero. So sometimes students ask, oh, cannot, can't the, the, the cat eta minimum be already zero? No, it can't, because we know eta minimum is a, a proper state of n, which can therefore be uh, normalized. Therefore, it cannot be zero. Okay? So eta minimum is equal to zero. So we are making a small step here. We found that the smallest value of the eigen's value of n, of the operator n, is zero. That's what we just did. Okay? We are going to call this eigenstate the state zero. Okay, this is the ground state. This is, uh, well, uh, this is the value for the smallest eta. You know, we, can, we have no reason to think of it tonight, a ground state just yet, so we'll see that in a few minutes. 
So, the, the, so in other words, we find the eigenstate of n as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on and so forth. That this is what we can do by raising the, oper uh, the operator n. Therefore, there's a reason why we call n the number operator. And now this is where we can do a big leap. Because remember, the Hamiltonian was h bar omega n plus 1 half, right? So, the eigenstate of operator n are also eigenstate of operator h, right? And the eigenstate of operator h uh, have eigenvalues that are integer values from 0 to infinity, essentially. So what we find is that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian from that perspective is simply given by n plus 1 half times h bar omega, and n going from integer step starting from 0. In other words, we've solved the problem. We found that the eigenstates are, are not zero, so that's one thing that's important. The lowest energy state for the Hamiltonian is half h bar omega. And then after that, we have all the possible eigenstates, which are plus one, plus one, plus one, and so on and so forth. So just like shown on the graphic. So we just found something important is that the energies are quantized. Uh, and they only take discrete values, and we don't, the minimum value of the energy is non-zero. So this is also summarized, again, the very same way what I just told you in, in this plot. All the states I, uh, have an equidistance, but there is a non-zero um, ground state. The ground state is h bar omega over 2. So let's try to learn a little bit more about the, those operators a and a dagger, and at the same occasion, n. And uh, we will do that by calculating the matrix element. So we have established already that the action of A and A dagger on an eigenstate of n is to, reduce, is to obtain an eigenstate of n, but in this time with an eigenvalue n minus 1. But what we don't know is what is the coefficient in front of that operator. Um, clearly, uh, A and A dagger are certainly not um, unitary, so there is no reason why C minus C, C minus and C plus should be um, uh, should be uh, uh, a no of norm one. So we are going to calculate what they are. Okay. First of all, we know that if a dagger applying uh, um, the action of a dagger, sorry, on the eigenstate eta is given by by the by what's written on the second line of the left hand side, we can then get the bra version of that by simply get, taking bras instead of cats, changing operators into the adjoint, and taking the complex conjugate of the scalar. So that's just what happens on the right-hand side. This is something that you've done before, but just as a reminder. Now, that allows me to calculate uh, the expectation value of a a dagger for an eigenstate n. So just to remind you, a a dagger is not the n operator, because the n operator is a dagger a, right? But we can go there by simply using the um, commutator relation between a and a dagger, which is equal to 1, if you remember, at the beginning of the screencast. Therefore, a a dagger is equal to a dagger a plus 1. This is a dagger a is the operator n. Therefore, we know exactly what's happening with the expectation value of, the, of a a dagger. This is n plus 1 times n n, which was going to supposed to be equal to 1, since we can certainly normalize all the eigenstate of Hermitian operator without a problem. Uh, at the same time, if we use the equation we wrote above by explicitly calculating the, the bracket between a dagger eta and eta a, we find that this is equal to c plus star c plus. So in other words, a, a choice of c plus would be to have a square root n plus 1, right, from those two equations that we have. So the, the choice is, uh, we could use a, an overall phase, but we can decide the phase to be equal to 1. And we find that uh, a dagger n is equal to square root n plus 1, n plus 1. Okay. At the same time, we can do the same exercise for a, and we find, uh, by using exactly the same procedure, find that the action of a on uh, state n is a square root n times n minus 1. Now we can calculate the matrix elements of this. And uh, of course, what we find is that the only uh, elements that are non-zero for A and A dagger in the N representations are those that are just either sub-diagonal for the A dagger or 
up per diagonal for A. Well, you know already very quickly from the equation on the top left that the diagonal element of A in the basis N are certainly going to be equal to zero. If you calculate the bracket N A N, that's equivalent to square root N bracket N N minus one, but N and N minus one are orthogonal, therefore it's zero, right? So that allows us to get A and A dagger very nicely. So very, very simple form in, um, in the N representation. Uh, you see that, again, just to, so you know, A and A dagger, obviously not Hermitian. That's pretty clear from this representation. Uh, they are not uh, unitary either. That's also pretty clear from the re this representation. And in fact, A and A dagger, it's really hard to represent them in matrix form because the size of the matrix is infinite since n can take any value between, z can any integer value between zero and infinity. Now, what is nice about this representation that's easy to calculate is that we can get the matrix representation of x and px. We just have to remember what we introduced at the beginning. Uh, actually, I didn't, I'm not doing it here, but uh, this is a good exercise for you to do. Um, is Since we say we know that x is some constant times a plus a dagger, and px is some constant times a uh, minus a dagger, you automatically see what the x and px representation in that basis will be very compact form again as well. Uh, in fact, if we, if we uh, apply uh, the equation uh, recursively, we can find, we can show, uh, and this is something that we can prove recursively as an exercise, that any state n is going to be obtained by the uh, consecutive application of the a dagger state on the state on the ground state divided by square root n factorial. The square root n factorial is there for normalization purposes, and in fact, you can uh, check that for the two states one and two and show that they are properly normalized by using the proper value of square root n factorial. So to summarize, so far what we've done, we've started with the Schrodinger equation and uh, we knew that it was difficult to solve, but uh, and then especially because we have a commutator relationship between x and px. Then we introduced two new operators, a and a dagger. We found that the uh, um, commutator relationship between x and px translated into a commutator relationship between a and a dagger. And that also allowed us to write the Hamiltonian now in terms of um, a and a dagger in a fairly compact way. So that means that at the end of the day, what we had to worry about is to calculate the eigenstate of the new operator, which is obtained by the product of a dagger and a. And we call that operator the n operator. The n operator actually has eigenvalues that are integer numbers. So there's a reason why we call it the number operator. And when we apply all this at the end of the day, we can actually solve for the Hamiltonian of the system. OK, so this is all nice. Uh, we have worked in operators. We've worked with Ket and Bras, but we have no idea what is the uh, real space representation simply because we have not used that representation. We have used the representation of the operator n. But we can do it now. And this is what we are going to do in this part. OK, so Remember, for the ground state, if I try to lo lower the ground state, we uh, certainly get zero because I cannot lower it any longer. So I also know what the A operator is. This is just how we introduced it. It's the definition of A, essentially. So if I want to look at the X representation of that zero state, I can replace um, A by uh, its definition. This is what I put in the blue box. And of course, we know it's equal to zero since A applied to the ground state is equal to zero. I cannot lower the ground state. Now, I have to remember the X representation of the two operators, X and PX, because this is really, really what I have on the bracket there, is an X representation of X and X representation of PX. Well, clearly the X representation of X is trivial because X is actually an eigenstate of X. And we know that the X representation of PX is H bar over I uh, times the first derivative with respect to X of the state. In other words, I have this. This is what I just told you in words. This is what we have. We replace these two equations in the equation above where there are the blue boxes. And I end up with this equation, 
which is a simple uh, first order differential equation, um, which is actually trivial to solve, of course, you find then that the X representation of the ground state is a Gaussian. Okay? Uh, if you're not convinced, uh, I invite you to um, substitute that Gaussian into the purple box and you will see that it's indeed correct. So the, all this study here allowed us to calculate the ground state of the, uh, the X representation of the ground state as a Gaussian. And then you can use the, uh, the relationship that we have uh, introduced for the any state n, which is a dagger to the power n divided by square root of n factorial. And once we, once we know the, the, the eigenstate zero, once we know the, the X representation of eigenstate zero, we can then apply those operator a dagger that we introduced in the previous slide recursively. And this equation there that we have in the red box, it look a little bit intimidating, but it really, it, it really is not. It's, a, it's just a matter of applying the, um, the differential operator over and over again on the previous state that we have. So, for example, we can calculate the first, the X representation of the first state and X representation of the second state. And what we find is that we have a Gaussian part times a polynomial of, of the same order as the number of the state. So, for example, for the one state, we have a polynomial of order one, it's just X. For the two states, we have a polynomial of order two, which is X squared minus I mean, two M omega over H bar A squared minus one. And you see that we actually either have the odd term in power or the even terms. We do not mix them. And this is something we see on the right hand side on the plot. We see that we either have an even state or an odd state. And when I say odd and even, I will introduce a little bit more detail about what they are by the end of the screencast. I'm talking about the parity of the, of the wave function with respect to the origin. Okay. So the point is that what we see here is that we start with a Gaussian, there is no zeros, okay, it doesn't cross the uh, x-axis, then we have a number of crossing the, of the x-axis, which is a, exactly equal to the number of the state. Right? We have one, two, three, four, five. And we understand now why the energy goes up as we move up it, with the numbers, because we increase the curvature, uh, which is, then the curvature is proportional to the kinetic energy. So we have more and more kinetic energy in each state, which essentially means that, uh, well, we increase the energy of the, of the states, of the eigenstate in particular. Okay, so that's what we have here. Um, I'd like you just to so, just summarize what I just told you, uh, the X representation of the N eigenstate as N nodes. Uh, this is increasingly oscillatory and that means that we have an increased kinetic energy. Okay, there's a reason why it's more and more excited state. And um, what's interesting is that um, we we find that the the the, the kinetic the, the 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 state goes farther and farther. Yeah. Okay. So I should try to show you with the two red line there. The, the red line on the dotted line on the right is the one that corresponds to x0 for the ground state and the other one is to correspond to x5 for the fifth state. So you see that as you increase your energy, the system oscillates farther and farther and farther, which means that you probably gain, start to, to probably probe part of the potential that's no longer well uh, described by a parabolic, a, a parabolic relationship. But uh, still, the point is that you go farther and farther uh, in in uh, in in the um, in the space in space farther farther from the origin. Okay, now let's try to, to go back to, to the energy. Now that we have uh, understood the uh, eigenvalues, let's let's talk a little bit about the zero point energy. So we know that the, the Hamiltonian, as we wrote it, uh, we found that there was a zero point energy. So even for the ground state, it has a non-zero energy. Um, and this is something you can understand from the plot that we had before, a Gaussian. You know, there is a finite curvature, so there is definitely some kinetic energy. And there is some potential energy as well, because the, um, the particle doesn't stay at the origin. So there is some potential energy. So this is something you see. You would have expected, if things were possible, that you would have a very um, sharp peak at the origin uh, if there was no zero-point energy. 
a sharp peak would not be possible because that means that we would have a, a complete um, knowledge of the position. That means that we would have an we would have an infinite uncertainty on the kinetic energy on the, on px so on the kinetic energy which means that the energy could not be zero okay so let's try to to just uh, formalize a little bit what i just told you about this problem with the uncertainty principle we can show that um, the fact that we have a zero point energy stems from the fact that we have an uncertainty principle and we can do it uh, completely formally and we are going to do it now so the equation that you have there is the expectation value of the energy for any state and of course, is the expectation um, expectation uh, value of the kinetic energy plus the expectation value of the potential energy, which can then be written in terms of the uncertainty and the square of the expectation value. I mean, if you don't see how this how this comes about, remember the definition of the uncertainty uh, delta p x is the square root of the expectation value of px squared minus the, squ the square of the expectation value of x, of, of px. Okay, so this is the definition of the uncertainty. Now, we see that we, we, we have those relationship, and what I'm going to do now is to show you that for the uh, ground state, the, on the right hand side of this equation, delta x squared. Uh, no, expect the square of the expectation value of px and the square of the expectation of x are equal to zero. So that's what we are going to do now. And we can show that by the equation that are there on the bottom left, where we replace x by a plus a dagger times square root h bar over 2m omega. And when we do that, we find that very quickly, we find that the it's clear that the, um, the diagonal element of a plus a dagger are equal to zero. Right? The diagonal element of A and A dagger are zero, so the sum is certainly equal to zero. And this is true for Px as well, since the Px is really proportional to A minus A dagger. So in other words, what this, is, this establishes is that the expectation value of X and Px for, an eigen, for any eigenstate of, of the Hamiltonian is zero. So therefore, it's certainly true for the ground state. So I find that the expectation value of the energy is simply the sum of two uncertainty relationship between px square and dx square. The uncertainty um, uncertainty on px, uncertainty on the on, on x. Okay. So that already shows you one thing: is that in order for the expectation value of the energy of the ground state to be zero, we would need to be to have delta px and delta x equal to zero. And clearly, that's impossible due to the uncertainty principle. So it's really the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that's responsible for the zero-point energy. So, as, so we just we, so in other words, delta p x and delta x cannot be zero. And so, what nature does is try to minimize this. So, try to have a minimum uncertainty for the ground state. So, for the ground state, we can calculate delta x square. And again, uh, this is simply playing with. Uh, the operators, and this would again be a good place to stop the screencast and to work it out. This is something we, we usually do in class. Uh, and then you can do the same for delta px squared. Okay? And when you do this, uh, you realize, of course, that delta x delta px is equal to h bar over 2 for the ground state. In other words, this is a minimum uncertainty state, which should not be a big surprise to you since that state is a Gaussian. And we already saw in the previous chapter that the Gaussian is the minimum uncertainty state. So that's all very much uh, consistent with what we've done before. We can calculate this, cal calculate this for a uh, non-ground state, and uh, we find that the uncertainty relationship o, uh, holds. And in fact, we can even calculate this product of delta x, delta px. It actually goes up linearly as a function of n. But, of course, it obeys the fact that this value is always higher than h bar over 2, since n is, a, n is a positive number. So we can apply this idea that there is a, a zero-point energy to, um, to real-life application. In fact, this, this, can, this explains why helium, liquid, uh, helium remains a liquid at, even at extremely low temperature. Uh, in fact, it is, helium is the only substance that, can, that does not solidify at uh, low temperature for normal pressure. And the reason for that is because we have a very weak interaction in helium atoms. 
And um, that means that we have uh, a frequency that's pretty, um, pretty low. And a low frequency rem means that we, we have a very large delta x, right? If you remember on the expectation, let me just go back here. If we have a, a small frequency like this, um, we have a very, so a small frequency means a small coupling, small energy, small values of energy that are involved. It means the delta x uh, is fairly large. And if delta x is very large, is that no matter what you do, you will never be able to bring the helium atom close enough to solidify. And this is the issue, is that the issue is that helium never solidify because the delta x, the minimum value of delta x is always larger than the distance at which helium would solidify. Of course, one way to solve this would be to increase the pressure, because by increasing the pressure, you would increase omega, you would increase the coupling, and then delta x will go down, and then you could make a solid. So this is a very straightforward application of the uncertainty principle for the harmonic oscillator in helium. And in fact, helium being this weakly coupled uh, uh, system, uh, we can certainly use the harmonic approximation close to the, to the minimum. Now, let's try to move on and, and try to see uh, how we can connect all those results with the large n limit. Uh, what is the large n limit? Well, it means that we have so much energy involved that we really are in a classical limit. And this is what we are going to try to figure out now. What is the, uh, how can we connect all this with classical uh, physics that we that we know. I mean, we know oscillators do behave classically in a re in a everyday life. So, so what? How can we connect both? Okay. So the quantum mechanical part is uh, is twofold, right? The quantum mechanical manifestation for the harmonic oscillator is twofold. The first is discrete energies and the zero point energy. Uh, but yet we don't see it, and the reason for that is because the distance between the energies is h bar omega, and h bar is extremely tiny. And this is what basically allows us to describe things classically. So let's, let's see uh, what happens uh, if we can actually connect to the large values of n. And for that, uh, we are going to first intro introduce a definition, and the first definition I want to introduce here is the classical turning point. And a classical turning point is this point where uh, an oscillator would actually stop the motion in one direction and stop and then move back to the other way. So this is essentially when you have a pendulum, this is when a pendulum reaches the maximum value of energy, um, uh, maximum distance from the origin, and then is ready to go back. Of course, at that point, uh, the velocity is essentially zero, right? Therefore, there is no kinetic energy, and the entire energy is potential energy. So this is what we call a classical turning point. Okay, this, so this is, this is something that, uh, that is very predictable, in fact, uh, because if there is no dissipation, we know exactly where the classical turning point will be. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, now, on this slide, which is a little bit busy, but it's actually not that complicated, we would like to calculate the probability of finding a given particle in a classical harmonic oscillator. What do I mean there? Well, we know that the probability of finding a particle at a given point is given by how much time it spends there. Okay, How much time it spends there is the time it takes to uh, go over a distance of delta x, let's say. So in other words, what I need, the probability of finding a particle between x and delta x is equal to delta x over the velocity of the particle at that time. Now the velocity is px over m and px square over 2m plus the potential energy is equal to the total energy. So in other words, you end up with the equation you have there, the delta x divided by the square root of 2e over m minus omega square x square. I mean this complicated, so-called complicated uh, relation is nothing else than the velocity. And of course, if you remember that the, from the previous slide, that the uh, ter classical turning point xn is where uh, the total energy is potential. So in other words, you can replace omega square xn square by 
twice the energy divided by m, okay? And then at the end of the day, after normalization, in other words, summing, making sure that the total probability is one, you find that the, prob the classical probability of finding a particle in a harmonic oscillator is given by the expression there on the bottom right. Well, what you see, if you plot this, you will see that, of course, there is some, uh, um, there is some singularity at the turning point, which makes sense because there the velocity is zero, and uh, that means that the time it spends there is, I mean, it, it's the, 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 the um, differential time it, it spends there is infinite, right? So the probability of finding there is very, very high. The rest behave like one over x squared. So in other words, we have the red curve there. And you see that um, the number of oscillation you have from quantum mechanics, so this would be the red, the blue curve, uh, start to look like this. So you say, well, hold on a second, it doesn't look quite like this. Well, there are two things. First of all, if you calculate the number of, of zeros in the in the um, in the blue in the in the black curve, you will find that it's 24 zero. So it's n equal 24. Now, if you look at the classical pendulum, which has a length of about 0 0.1 meter about 10 radians per second, right? I mean, you can consider that it's that, that's uh, roughly like a, like a clock. I mean, a clock would be 2 pi per second. That gives an h bar omega of e of 10 minus 26 because of the very, very small value of h bar. And that would require n of 10 to the power 26. So you would need 10 to the power 26 zero. So can you imagine how the oscillation, of course I can't plot it because the resolution of this screen or actually any resolution can, can represent 10 to the power 26 uh, points over a few centimeter lengths. But the point is um, what I plotted there on the screen is 24. The reality is 10 to the power 26 for classical. Now this is one thing. The second thing is you have so quick oscillation that your eyes really sees the average. And the average, you can see that will follow the red line. So there is one-to-one one -to -one correspondence between the classical result and the quantum mechanical result for n, which is extremely large. This is what this slide and the previous slide establish. This is called the correspondence principle. And it's a very important principle. It means that uh, there, there is a way to connect the prediction of quantum mechanics with those of classical physics. And this was uh, a concept that was introduced by Niels Bohr. Of course, it's a key concept because um, if a theory, if a new theory cannot uh, account for our everyday uh, experience, then clearly something is, is amiss. And here, this is an example of where there's a, a strong correspondent principle between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Now, we are interested in time dependence, and uh, we are going to work, uh, look at the time dependence and time evolution of a uh, harmonic oscillator. And for that, uh, we, are, we are not going to just look at an Hagen set of the Hamiltonian, because we know for Hagen, Hagen set of Hamiltonian, the time evolution is, is really boring. In fact, the only evolution is to multiply by your uh, overall phase factor, as you remember from the uh, uh, time evolution operator that we have introduced in the previous chapter. So instead, we are going to look at the superposition of two states, for example, n and n plus 1. And we know that the time evolution of that state will be given uh, by the second equation on this slide, which is the complex exponential e to the power minus i uh, operator h t over h bar. And we know by now that the, an easy way to uh, calculate this is to uh, find the representation uh, of the state psi zero in the eigenstate uh, of h, because then we know how that exponen complex exponential operates on those eigenstate of h. Okay, so that's what's done on the last slide, on the last line, where we also highlighted an overall phase, so that the first term of the, in the two in the sum is has no complex phase in front of it. Okay, so this is what's happening. Now we can look at that for particularly for, for example, two consecutive states like the ground state and the first excited state uh, with a 50-50% per superposition, right? This is what the 1 over square root 2 does. And we can calculate that in that case, the expectation value of the position as a function of time is, going, is given by a cos omega t. So this is, is oscillatory 
uh, motion. Uh, this is a few snapshot of that, uh, snapshots of that motion is given on the top right figure there, where we see that the, the, the wave, the, the, the quantum state, the wave, the wave function actually oscillate from left to right uh, as a function of time. Uh, and you can calculate this, of course, you can calculate the expectation value of A cos omega t, and this is what the equation there shows, and you can calculate the expectation value again this is something that uh, there is nothing really crazy in this calculation. You just have to remember what the A and A dagger operator um, uh, do, uh, what, what, they, what they do on an eigenstate of n, and this is what we've established at the, uh, at the beginning of the screencast. So the point is that, again, this is something I invite you to do and take your time doing. The speed doesn't matter as long as you get it right. And this allows you to find that the expectation value of the position is indeed cos omega t. And again, this is a this is a blow up view of the picture from the previous slide where we see that the position is not very well localized and the particle oscillate back and forth. And we know that because we no longer have a stationary state, right? So I'd like to insist on this. If you have the sum of two stationary state is not a stationary state unless the two those, those two stationary states are degenerate. Okay. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on coherent state. Um, this is something that uh, I often skip in a, in a given lecture, in, in the lecture, even though that's because there is a, there is a lot of, of calculation that should be done, um, uh, that takes time to do it. And instead of, of just doing it myself on the, on the blackboard, I think it's best for students to do it on their own by, for example, following the screencast. Um, there is nothing really crazy about this. It's, it's really about uh, the mechanics of using um, the operators A and A dagger. So let's me in, let me introduce you what the coherent state is. Uh, uh, coherent state are. Well, a coherent state is a special superposition of energy against state of the uh, os uh, harmonic oscillator, which is actually turns out to be an eigenstate of the lowering operator. So that's a definition. A coherent state is an eigenstate of the lowering operator. So when we have that eigenstate, so so clearly what we want is is is, is to be able to solve this this problem here, which is really an eigenvalue problem uh, for the operator a, and that state by definition, the alpha state there is going to be called a coherent state. So what we need to do now is to be able to write that state in the basis of these eigenstate of n, of the operator n. So, um, of course, can a coherent state also be an eigenstate of h? Of course, we know it cannot because a and h do not commute. Okay, so we have established that already. Okay, so we are going to write that, eig that eigenstate, which is a coherent state, as, a, as just on the basis of n, since there are infinite number of basis states, we're going to write it this way. And all we need to do now is to find the, what are the value of the coefficients uh, cn. Uh, and what we remember, of course, is that the operation of a on n is to lower it with a prefactor square root n. That's what we have established as well. So let's do that. Uh, if we operate a on the left hand side on the, the, the equation and on the right hand side, we automatically find uh, something like this, right? When you remember also that it's equivalent to applying alpha to the state alpha. Okay. Okay, so here on the top, I repeated the, the equation I had at the last uh, slide before. Uh, we can rewrite the left hand side uh, slightly. Uh, uh, differently by starting at zero. So I shift everything by one. I have a dummy variable n prime. That, that means that I can rename it any time I, any way I want. So that's how I get to the next equation. And of course we have a coherent state. So in other words, the equality is correct so long as square root n plus one times the coefficient c n plus one is equal to alpha c n. And this is how we obtain this uh, recursive uh, relationship between Cn and C0. Uh, so if we know C0, we can get C1, C2, C3, and so on and so forth. And if I apply all those coefficients, I'm going to end up with a state that's a coherent state. That's an eigenstate of A. 
And in other words, the state alpha is an eigenstate of A written in the basis of the eigenstate of N. And of course, that state is not an eigenstate of N. So we can find C0, right? Because once we have C0, we can calculate everything. So this is how the alpha is written, and, and uh, this is the, how the bra alpha is written as well. Um, remember, the alphas are not necessarily a real number. In fact, they're not. And then we can, cal we can calculate the bracket alpha alpha and impose that this is going to be normalized. So this is a little bit tedious, but nothing really complicated to do. It's just a, a product of two sum. And uh, when, we, when we're, everything is said and done, we find in the last equation that what we have there with the sum is nothing else than the Taylor series of the exponential function uh, for the argument uh, alpha square. So this is the reason why we can write the last term. So in other words, we know that C0 must be equal to uh, e to the minus alpha square over 2 so that the bracket alpha alpha is equal to 1. Okay, so this is how we can call C0. And finally, we can write that the coherent state is written by this. So you see here, we, this is mostly a good exercise to manipulate uh, the lowering operator. Um, the point is that we can calculate a coherent state that is going to be an eigenstate of A. Now we can, we can now use that state and see how it evolves with time. Uh, which is going to be fairly easy to calculate since that state is already expressed in the basis of the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So for that, we just have to, uh, and here, I'm sorry, this, all the details are here, but it looks a little bit more complicated than it actually is. The first line there was obtained simply by uh, introducing the phase factor coming from the time evolution. And then the next, the next two lines are simply just some simple manipulation, some algebraic manipulation. Uh, the final uh, line, though, uh, again, uses the expression of the exponential, um, the, the, the Taylor series of the exponential function. So the point is, at the end of the day, what we obtain is that the, eigens the state, the coherent state alpha of, the of time, um, is going to evolve like uh, like it is written on the slide right now. So of course we, we started from there. So the uncertainty for the co now we can calculate the uncertainty relationship for the coherent state and again it's a matter of applying uh, a and a dagger. Uh, of course the big advantage now is that we know that alpha uh, we can we can actually calculate uh, th those states uh, fairly easily. And we obtain that, uh, that uh, the value of alpha is going to be uh, written in just a complex number. This is what the last equation there shows. And uh, px also can be calculated. So the expectation value of px can also be calculated for the time evolution of the coherent state. That allows us on the left hand side to calculate the expectation uh, value for x and on the right hand side to get the expectation value of px for that particular state. Okay, so the expectation value uh, oscillates for both uh, with, a phase with a phase difference of, of, of pi over 2, right? So when one is maximum, the other one is minimum and, and vice versa. And then we can also calculate the expectation value of the square and expectation value of the px square. Um, again, I'm not spending too much time describing how we go uh, around this. Um, this is a bit tedious. There's nothing really complicated, really. It's just, just a matter of bookkeeping. Uh, this is not where the important message is. The important message is that, of course, we can calculate the uncertainty for both cases. And we find at the end of the day, after all said and done, uh, it's a good exercise if you have difficulties uh, playing with those numbers. But when everything is said and done, we find that delta x and delta px are independent of time. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's all this all this to, for justifying the name of the state. The name of the state is coherent because the uncertainty does not depend on time. Okay, so when we talk about coherence, when we have when we have some uh, when we want to preserve coherence, that means that we do not have modification of the uh, spreading or something like that in time because the expectation value does not change. Okay, 
So, uh, I'm sorry, the uncertainty, like the expectation value actually does change, but the, unser the uncertainty for both the delta x and delta px are constant in time, therefore the name coherent state. Okay, so this is what w this is what we find here for at especially uh, uh, for the ground state. Okay, for the ground state in particular, we have that. Okay, so I, what the message from the previous part, which is goes a little bit fast, is that we can build a coherent state and then uh, try to connect this to what we know from uh, classical physics. And there, or the other reason why I introduced this part, coherent state, is it's because we always talk about coherence. We, also, we say, oh, if there is no coherence, therefore it's very hard to make measurements and things like that. And this is very true. The coherence uh, part of it is, is the fact that we have uh, an uncertainty that does not depend on time. It doesn't mean the uncertainty is minimal. It means that the uncertainty does not depend on time. Okay. Uh, now, let's move way, 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 way back and try to see uh, if we could solve the problem without using the operators, okay? So for that, we are going to go back and describe the Schrodinger equation position space. We actually did that in the previous chapter, but we are going to remind uh, the main results for just to, for a few seconds, and then we see how we can solve this. So this is my Hamiltonian. This is how this is the X representation of the Hamiltonian uh, of the eigenstate problem of the Hamiltonian. Um, this is just plugging in the description of the Hamiltonian. And that means, obviously, that if I remember that uh, the X representation of Px and the X representation of X, I can write a differential equation like this, uh, where the number Xe is a function of the position, is actually the wave function, for which is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. We've done that in the previous chapter. So we can rewrite that equation um, like it's written in the, in the box there, um, with the following uh, substitution. The first thing is that we're going to introduce the dimensional distance y, and we are going to describe the wave function as phi of y, and then we introduce the uh, dimensionless energy, which is 2e over h bar omega. So we end up with this equation. So there's nothing really uh, amazing here. This is the Schrodinger equation with dimensionless data. Yeah, so this is this is really the harmonic oscillator in the real space representation for energy epsilon. And then once we have solved this, we can go back to the the previous slide to see the relationship between epsilon and the actual energy and the position and the and the, the, the the position y versus the the, the dimensional x, which is related to y by just a coefficient. Okay, so we have to solve this problem. So this is what we do in quantum physics. We do not wish to use operators. So how do we solve this? Well, first of all, we are going to think about very large value of y. So what happens when y is extremely large, right? When y is extremely large, epsilon minus y square is essentially equal to minus y square. So we can write this equation, which is much easier to solve. Indeed, we know that one solution of this problem is given by the sum of these two functions, one being the Gaussian. And of course, we know again that uh, we want to be able to normalize the wave function. So certainly b has to be equal to zero because Otherwise, that term e to the power y squared over 2 would blow up at infinity, so I could not normalize the wave function. So I certainly know that uh, my, my solution will be, sorry, I went a bit fast here. I certainly know that the solution will be proportional to e to minus y squared over 2. Now we can see what's the effect of multiplying that solution by, uh, by just the coefficient y to the power to the power m, let's say. So this is what this is doing here on this equation. So for large m, we can also choose any solution with the power of y times the decreasing exponential. The reason we can do that is because the exponential e to the power of minus y squared over 2 de de uh, decreases faster than any polynomial of any order. So let's, let's see what happens. Well, this is just uh, calculating the, the second derivative of a product of two functions. And we see that when y is very, very large, we do indeed see that 
this solution y to the power m times the Gaussian is also a solution to the problem. So that's very nice because that means now that we could probably write the solution for any value of y as a combination of terms like this. In other words, we could certainly write a solution that looks like the wave functions equal to some series times the Gaussian, and the series is given by this term, okay, the, on the bottom right. So we have a series h of y, which would still be the sum of every possible, uh, which, is, which is a sum of every, any possible power of y. We don't know what the coefficient a k is, but we certainly know that we should be able to do this. At least what we already know is that we can use that as a solution for very large value of y. Now, we can reintroduce that solution uh, that's psi of y equal to h y times e minus y squared over 2 inside the solution on the, on the box that's on the top of the slide, and then we end up with this equation there on the bottom left. And then we end up, it's a slightly easier problem to solve. It's still second order, uh, but we now are going to work on it, and we're going to try to solve this for a solution h, which is given by this series from k equals 0 to infinity. So let's do that. So what we are going to do now is to substitute that series into the equation on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is what we have. So we obtain something like this. So this is very typical solution. So we have three terms, of course. The first term comes from the second derivative, the second term from the first derivative, and the last term from the independent term. Uh, the first term, of course, we, we end up with a y to the power k minus 2, since we have two, two derivatives. And the second term, we keep y to the power k. And the reason for that is because we have a first derivative, but that term is multiplied by y. So what we see when we see this is that the, the two terms, so there are three terms in the sum, the two terms on the right have a power y to the power k. The other one is y to the power k minus 2. So the, when you see something like this, what's important is to be able to rewrite the first term as of y to the power k. So that's what we are going to do now uh, so that we can actually put y to the power k outside of the, you know, in, in, in front of everything so that it's easier to, to calculate the coefficients. Okay, so first of all, let's focus on that first term there, uh, which involves y to the power k minus 2. We know that the first two terms, k equals 0 and k equal 1, are 0 because we have k times k plus k minus 1 in front. So really what the first term is, is this on the left hand side. Now I can replace k by k prime plus 2. The advantage of doing this is that I end up with a sum that started 0. And I just replace k by k prime plus 2. And when I do that, I end up with a dummy variable, which is k prime, that goes to zero from 0 to infinity. So here, remember, the key point to be able to write this is that the first two term of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the term that involves y to the power k minus 2 vanish. So that's nice because now I can reintroduce this inside the equation I had on the top and I end up with an equation like this where I have y to the power k. And of course I can do this because I go from k equals 0 to infinity. So now you're almost done, right? Because you have this term, uh, we have a coefficients time time a value of y to the power k, it has to be equal to 0 for any value of, of y. And of course, um, calculus tells you that the only way to get this done is for each coefficient to be equal to 0. This is the only way to have this, uh, this uh, identity equal to 0 is for the each coefficient to be equal to 0. In other words, we need to have a k plus 2 over a k given by this. So this is how we get um, the, all the coefficients equal to zero. Okay, so you know what we are doing, just to remind you, we are trying to find a solution for h of y in, in a series form. And what we've just done is obtain all the a k plus 2 as a function of a k. This is how we solve the equation. So we're not yet there, we're not there just yet, but almost. Okay, so we have this. Okay, good. Now let's try to think a little bit when, k, you know, the series goes to k equal to infinity. So what happens when k is very large? When k is very large, 
Um, yes, before I'm sorry, before I go to k very large, if a1 equal to 0, the solution will be an even function of y. And if, if a0 equals 0, the solution will be a not function of y, of course. This is what it means. If a equals 0, all the a2, 4, 6, 8, and so on will be 0. If a1 equals 0, then all the 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on will be 0 by this equation. Okay, sorry. So now let, let me say that for large value of k. Well, for large value of k, that expression there is going to behave as 2 over k. Indeed, the numerator will behave as 2k, right? And the denominator will behave as k squared. In other words, the ratio will behave as 2 over k. Now, this is kind of the thing that we know we need to know the answer in order to be to show it and this is where students sometimes get stuck a little bit so please pay attention now it turns out let's go back to the to a solution suppose the solution was e to the power y square and of course I can write this as a Taylor series that's what is written it turns out that if I look at the ratio between any two consecutive number, I mean, not consecutive, by skipping one, so bk over plus 2 divided by bk for the Taylor series of e to the power y square. I find that, that those coefficients behave exactly, the ratio behave exactly as 2 over k as well. In other words, a series for which the coefficients behave as, the, the ratio of k plus 2 over k is 2 over k divided by k, corresponds to e to the power y square. In other words, a solution like this is not acceptable because that would be a wave function that would not um, be normalizable. And remember, there was a term, there was a Gaussian in front of, of the solution, which was e to the power minus y square over 2. So the fact here that we have e to the power y square would actually, even if I, comp if I multiply by the Gaussian part, would still blow up at infinity. Okay, so clearly something is wrong here because that solution is not possible. So what, it, what actually happens is that I do not go to very large k. In fact, I must impose the series to stop at some value of k. Okay, so there is a value of k, let's say n, that's after which everything is zero. And the only way for these coefficients to be zero after some value is for this 2n plus 1 which plus minus epsilon to be equal to 0. So that's what we have here. Uh, so just, just to repeat what I just said, we need to have a point where there is a value of k which is maximal, maximal in that series, let's say k equal n, after which all the coefficients will be 0. So in other words, when the numerator is equal to 0, in other words, 2n plus 1 minus epsilon equal to 0, in other words, epsilon equal to n plus 1. So you see here, what we find is that the energy is quantized as well. It has to be equal to 2n plus 1 with the appropriate units that we have introduced a few slides ago. And when we do that, what we find is that the energy is quantized and the, instead of having a series, we have a polynomial for the solution of the H. And actually H is called the Hermit polynomial. Uh, so this is this is what I, I mentioned by epsilon being uh, normalized. So we find the same answer as we did with the operators, and H is is a polynomial of uh, of order n. It's called the Hermit uh, polynomial, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we can uh, calculate uh, all the coefficients like this in this in this example. This is going to be done uh, during um, this. This is done during the recitation. We usually study this. The point is. And going back here, and I'm sorry to go back and forth with those slides, but if n equal to 0, that means that all the coefficients, uh, there's no, the, w w the series actually never starts. So it's always, it's equal, so the, the, the polynomial is actually 1, which we know because the solution, the ground state solution for the harmonic oscillator is just a Gaussian. So there is, the Hermit polynomial is just the value 1. And then you keep going and you find the same solution as we found for the X representation of the eigenstate of the operator N. The reason why I do this here is just to show you the power of the, of the um, operator approach. Uh, we solve exactly the same problem. This one, I think, is a little bit tedious. So it's an example of... Um, oh, this is a, an example where 
the mathematical beauty of introducing the appropriate pr uh, operators can solve can can be very useful to avoid having to scratch your head and see how you solve this problem here. Okay, so we we're going to do to do this. Uh, this this is some this is a very good thing to do the example seven five to understand what are the different polynomials. Okay, so now it's time to to go to the to the last part of of the screencast. So I do realize this chapter is really heavy, is loaded with a lot of concept and uh, important things that really put to a test your understanding of quantum mechanics so far. So I really uh, advise you to to uh, study this chapter very carefully because it's, it's really loaded with information and concept. Okay, so just just to, to open a parenthesis here, which is the last part of this of the screencast about the inversion symmetry. Um, it turns out that we we have seen that uh, the solution of the harmonic oscillator involved other and even function of the position, right? We found the Gaussian, which is of course even. Then we found the next states, the, the the n equal one state, which was an odd function, right? And then odd even, odd even, odd even. In fact, the the evenness of uh, of a, f of a solution is directly related to n. So if n is even, then the solution is even. If n is odd, the solution is odd. So clearly, something must be going on with the operators that we could we could have maybe used and we will use in uh, future lectures. Is the another operator, and we're going to call it the parity operator. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes introducing the parity operator for you. So we have those functions, as I said, some are even, some are odd. So an even function, of course, is one when psi minus x of minus x is equal to psi x, and odd function is psi minus x is minus psi x. Okay, that is that's the that's the definition of even and oddness, evenness and oddness. We are going to introduce a parity operator, and that operator operates on eigenstate of the x operator. And what it does is that the operator uh, when it operates on x, is give me is going to give me minus x state. That's the definition of the parity operator. The eigenstate of the operator will be given by uh, the eigenstate the eigens value problem for the operator uh, pi. The parity operator will be given by this. Um, I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise that the operator is actually a uh, Hermitian operator. It is a Hermitian operator, so lambda are going to be real. We can operate twice. So when we operate twice, we get pi square. Of course, pi square, I flip and flip again. So I get the same state, clearly. Uh, that means that I also pick up a lambda square. That means that lambda has to be equal to plus or minus one. Right. In other words, in, if lambda is real and lambda square is equal to one, lambda is equal to plus or minus one. So what we find that uh, the two eigenvalues for the parity operator are plus and minus one. Okay. So that's nice. Now, if I try to calculate the x representation of the action of the operator pi, I then find what I was expecting to find. So I find that I have uh, this, uh, this state, the first state, that the x representation of my state is psi minus x. So basically, I'm just essentially uh, switching the sign. And in, by the way, in this case, I just if you don't see how I get the first line, it's because pi being Hermitian, it can operate on the left-hand side on the bra, so it becomes minus x. And then I can do, I can do the same operating on an eigen uh, state of pi. And again, I operate on the left on x, and I find that when I do this, of course, I know that pi also, when it operates on, on psi of lambda, I get lambda psi lambda of x. So I find that um, we have an even function of x in, in the x representation for lambda equal one, and we have an odd function x for lambda equal minus one. So that, that justifies the, the name of a parity operator for pi. Now here is the good thing. Let's try to calculate the commutation relationship between the pi operator and the Hamiltonian. 
And again, we are going to apply the fact that the pi uh, operator can apply to the left. So this is what's written there on the, on, on the top line. And then on the second equality, on the right hand side of the second equality, I've simply um, plug in the value of the operator h in the x representation. So of course, all the x became minus x because this, is, this was in the minus x representation. It didn't change the first term, change the, but changed the potential term and changed the wave function term. At the same time, this is also equal to the terms that is obtained um, that it, that's obtained right there because we suppose that the, that the potential is going to be even. Okay, so Vx equals V minus X. And of course, if I do that, I realize that this is the same thing as the Hamiltonian operating on a state psi that of, on which I, I applied the parity operator, right? Because only psi becomes psi of minus x. So in other words, pi h is equal to h pi. And this is an extremely important result. It means that if my potential is an even function, actually even if it was an odd function, we find that uh, the, op the parity operator and the Hamiltonian commute. And this is nice, because if they commute, that means that I can choose eigenstate of the Hamiltonian that are also eigenstate of the parity operator. And this is exactly what we find. We find that the eigenstate of the harmonic oscillator have a given parity. In other words, they are also eigenstate of the parity operator, which they can be since uh, the parity operator in the Hamiltonian is zero. So this is, this is what we establish here. Uh, I, I think this is a very important result. And in fact, we use that in, in a group theory. The fact that a Hamiltonian commute with an operator allows us to simplify the problem by simply looking at solutions that are also eigenstate of that symmetry operator.